Hi everybody, this is Joe Chaffin and I would like to welcome you to the Blood Bank Guy podcast. It is June 2013 and today we're going to be doing a full length tutorial on the often confusing and for me always entertaining Lewis blood group system. Now I know that for some of you the thought of Lewis doesn't exactly fill you with excitement but I'm really here to tell you today that absolutely Lewis can be entertaining. Lewis can be fun. And in fact, if you look at the world of entertainment, you can see that there have been tons of Lewises that have made us happy over the years. I mean, just take a look. Daniel Day-Lewis, sure, absolutely. Uh, the famous wild man of rock and roll, the killer, Jerry Lee Lewis. And of course, honestly, the singer who provided the soundtrack to my high school years, that would be Huey Lewis from Huey Lewis, Huey Lewis and the News. Uh, Lewis Carroll, he wrote Alice in Wonderland, of course, and my favorite poem of all time, The Fabulous Jabberwocky. And of course, no list of entertaining Lewises is complete without the hilarious Al Lewis, who those of you that are old like me will remember starred as grandpa in the TV series The Monsters. So here's the deal. I will accept absolutely no argument that states that Lewis is not fun. It is fun or at least it can be fun, and let's try and make it fun today. We're gonna to talk about it, and we're gonna go over the basic biochemistry of the system, the genetics and antigens, the antibodies, and some unique stuff about the Lewis system. So in order to discuss the basic biochemistry, we need to talk about the first, the basic building blocks of the entire ABO blood group system, because Lewis antigens are built on some of the same chains that we see in ABO. And really, for any ABO-related system, such as ABO, Lewis, Big I, and the P1PK system, we're talking about a very similar concept. Basically, we're talking about a scenario where we have a passenger, as illustrated by the space shuttle in this really great picture of the space shuttle Endeavor, and the passenger is cool. The passenger gets all kinds of cool names, like Atlantis, Challenger, Columbia, in our, in our example here. Um, but what it's carried by, the, the transporter, is just kind of a boring 747, and we really see the same kind of concept in the ABO-related systems. In the different types of chains, and today we'll be talking about type 1 chains and type 2 chains, the same principle applies. We have an exciting passenger, and the passenger is an oligosaccharide, and I'm just showing you the last two residues in, in, these, uh, in these, these oligosaccharides. And then the R group is, is the carrier, and the R group, the carrier, is either a protein or a lipid, making the whole chain either a glycoprotein or a glycolipid. Now let's look more specifically at the type 1 chains. Type 1 chains are actually what we're going to be talking about mostly today, because Lewis antigens are built on type 1 and not type 2 chains. Well, what's the difference? Type 1 chains as you're probably aware, have a very unique binding between the, the terminal galactose and the subterminal N-acetylglucosamine, and that's a beta-1-3 linkage. And I, I don't know that the exact memory of beta-1-3 is hugely important for most of you, but it, it is a difference from the type 2 that we'll talk about in just a second. But more importantly for our discussion today, type 1 chains are found in secretions, where they're primarily glycoprotein, and as well, they f they're found floating around in plasma where they're primarily glycolipids. So secretions, glycoproteins, plasma, glycolipids. We tend to think about type 1 chains as primarily being in secretions because of the activity of the secretor gene that we're going to talk about in just a minute. But you should also remember that they are in plasma. And when they are in plasma, especially when we talk about the Lewis blood group system, they are primarily glycolipid. Now, just for completeness sake, though the Lewis system is not built on type 2 chains, let's just, let me just mention type 2 chains, which are obviously present widely in the ABO system, the type 2 chains have a different linkage of the galactose and the N-acetylglucosamine, a beta-1-4 linkage. And of more importance for our discussion today is that type 2 chains are the types that are found integrally bound to red cell membranes. We think of them as primarily glycolipids. A lot of them are glycoproteins as well. You'll see varying discussions on, on the proportion. It really doesn't matter for our discussion today because they're completely separate from what we're describing. Okay, so let's go back to our type 1 chains and let's talk about the enzymes or the gene products that act on these type 1 chains. Well, there are two main enzymes for the purpose of our discussion today. First is the secretor enzyme, and the, the secretor enzyme comes from the expression of the secretor gene, or the capital SE gene. Um, the, the SE gene, or the fucosal transferase 2, FUT2 gene, codes for an enzyme which adds fucose to type 1 chains, and about 80% of us are able to do this. It adds a fucose in exactly that position right there. Um, when that happens, that type 1 chain by itself is changed into a type 1 H antigen. Now, 
The H antigen is massively important in the ABO blood group system, and it's also important in Lewis, very important. But let's, let's talk about it in ABO for just a second so you'll have the background. In the ABO system, the H antigen, whether we're talking about a type 1 or a type 2 chain, and a different enzyme acts on uh, a, a type 2 chain. So again, we're focusing on type 1. On this type 1 chain, once you make H, then you can, then you can turn that chain into an A, either an A or a B. Depending on what your genotype is, you will have either an A transfer transferase enzyme, and if you do have an A transferase, transferase enzyme, it'll act on this terminal galactose to throw in um, an, an N-acetylgalactosamine, and that makes the A antigen. However, if you have a B uh, gene or a B allele, you're able to make a B transferase, and that B antigen transferase will add a galactose to make the B antigen. So again, you have to have H first. Once you have H, you can make either A or B. So that's the, the general background to what we're talking about. Now let's go specifically to the Lewis blood group system and talk about the genetics and antigens in Lewis because they're all very closely related to what you've just learned or hopefully just reviewed in terms of the basic biochemistry of ABO. So in the Lewis system, uh, we have actually one active allele. It is the LE allele, capital L, small e allele. It is the FUT3 gene. Uh, FUT3 stands for fucosal transferase 3. Now there is an inactive allele there. It's designated as little l e, so small l uh, e, and, and that it doesn't code for anything, but the, the big l e allele uh, will code for what's called the Lewis enzyme. And the Lewis enzyme does something very specific, again, only on type 1 chains. The Lewis enzyme will cause a fucose to be added on this subterminal N acetylglucosamine. So if you go onto the subterminal N-acetylglucosamine on a unmodified type 1 chain, a naked type 1 chain, if you will, turns that plain type 1 chain into the antigen Lewis A. Now you also remember, of course, we've just talked about the fact that the secretor allele is also trying to act on these naked type 1 chains to turn that naked type 1 chain into an H antigen by adding a fucose at the terminal galactose. So again, we have we have kind of a competition here. We've got two enzymes, the secretor enzyme and the Lewis enzyme, that are trying to act on these unmodified type 1 chains to turn those chains into either type 1 H antigen, as you see here, or into the Lewis A antigen. Now if both get to work on a particular chain in a particular order that we'll talk about in just a second. This is massively important. If both the secretor enzyme and the Lewis enzyme act on that particular chain, in other words, if you have fucose in both places that I just showed you, then that chain will not only have H antigenic activity, but it will have Lewis B antigenic activity. Okay, so both, both fucoses there gives you Lewis B and not Lewis A. Only one of them, where the Lewis, where the Lewis enzyme puts it, will, will give you Lewis A. Okay, we're gonna show you more about that in just a second. So it's, it's kind of easy to conceptualize this, I hope, but let me make it hopefully a little simpler for you. So let, let's take a look. We, we really have an enzyme war here. So if you have both an active secretor allele and an active Lewis allele, then you will have two enzymes that are competing for these unmodified type 1 chains that, again, are floating around in plasma as glycolipids. Okay, so on those type 1 chains, it's really easy to imagine these enzymes battling each other and, and think of it as maybe it's kind of a fair fight. In other words, we got a couple of enzymes, a couple of goofy-looking enzymes here that are sitting there kind of fighting each other and trying to attack these type 1 chains, not really attack, but modify them into their respective antigens. But it's actually not a fair fight at all. To be truthful, if you look at the comparison between the activity of the Lewis enzyme and the secretor enzyme, it's actually a little bit more like, oh, say this. So we got the big bad secretor enzyme that's much more active, much more hyper, much better at attacking those type 1 chains. Again, I say attacking. I'm, I'm getting carried away. I apologize. Much better at modifying those type 1 chains into uh, first the type 1 H antigen. So how does that look? So let, let's take a look at a, at a plain type 1 chain and let's see the different options in the place that it, places that it can go. For simplicity's sake, and we'll change this later, but for simplicity's sake, let's assume that the person we're talking about here is blood group O. So in a blood group O person, um, and again, for the sake of our example, let's say that this person has an active Lewis enzyme because they, they're one of those two genotypes that you see there and has an active secretor enzyme. So 
again, that type one chain has a couple of different options depending on which enzyme gets there first. And based on what I've already told you, it shouldn't be a surprise that proportionally speaking, the super secretor enzyme is much better at grabbing that uh, a type one chain and changing it into type one H antigen by adding the fucose um, at the terminal galactose. Now a small number of those type one chains, in fact, a very small number are gonna be changed into Lewis A by the Lewis enzyme putting its fucose there. But again, secretor enzyme, big, bad, tough, much better than the Lewis enzyme. So it goes on and does what it does. Now, once the, once the secretor enzyme on the right side of the slide here has done its work, then the little Lewis enzyme can come along and modify that type one H chain by adding the second fucose at the appropriate place, the only place that the Lewis enzyme acts and changing that chain into a type one H and the Lewis B activity. Again, if you have both of those fucoses there, the whole chain carries Lewis B activity and not Lewis A. Now looking over to the left of the slide, um, it, we, can, we can look at that little Lewis enzyme and say, you know, He's not very tough. He's not very strong. He really doesn't do a whole heck of a lot. And, and you might, but you might be tempted to look at that Lewis A and say, oh, okay, well, super secretor can now come over here to Lewis A and it can act on that chain and turn it into Lewis B. Well, actually it doesn't. So despite the fact that our, our nice little Lewis enzyme seems to be all sweet and nice and doesn't seem to, doesn't seem to fight the, the super secretor enzyme very well, actually, once the Lewis enzyme acts on a type one chain, it puts on what I call the Lewis lock. In other words, words, once Lewis enzyme acts on a chain, on a type one chain, regardless of where it is, that chain is no longer modified. So despite all of secretor enzyme strength, it can't do anything else to that Lewis enzyme chain. Uh, so as a result, or sorry, to that Lewis A chain. So as a result, the vast majority of what we see in the, a person who has this a blood group O in this particular genotype is the combination of H antigen and Lewis B antigen. If you look at this quantitatively, what you'll see is that you're gonna make a tiny little bit of Lewis A and a whole lot of Lewis B, both in your secretions and in your plasma. So I hope that makes sense. Let's move on and talk about, again, staying with the blood group O person. What if a person has the Lewis enzyme as a result of that genotype, one of those two genotypes, but lacks the secretor enzyme because they're little se, little se. Well, then the, the choice is pretty obvious. That type one chain has, only has one direction to go. The Lewis enzyme acts and makes Lewis A and nothing on the right side of the slide can happen because the super secretor enzyme is not even there. So as a result, what we would see in terms of quantitatively is we in the Lewis system, we would see only Lewis A and no Lewis B whatsoever. Just showing you there at the bottom. All Lewis A, no Lewis B. Okay, again, I hope that makes sense. Let's look again at a type, uh, switch the situation around, a blood group O person who lacks a Lewis gene. So no Lewis enzyme, they're little le, little le, but they have a secretor gene. Well, again, the type one chain has no other option but to go down the secretor pathway and become type one H, um, and, but it can't go any further and become Lewis B. And obviously the other pathway Way is not available because again the person doesn't have the Lewis enzyme. So as a result in this particular individual all the type 1 chains or the vast majority of the type 1 chains are going to be changed into type 1 H and nothing else. They would be Lewis A negative, B negative. And in fact, the, some people used to call this type 1 H that you see there, some people used to call that Lewis C. You'll see that in some of the older papers that are that are around. So again, that's Lewis C and that we don't really use anymore. It changes into type 1 H. This is what would happen in a blood group O person with these different combinations of Lewis and secretor uh, genotypes. I hope that makes sense to you because we're gonna make it a little more complicated now. We're gonna take a person um, and take them from uh, with, the, with the same kind of scenario that I described before with a Lewis gene, with a secretor gene, uh, active allele I should say of either one, but we're gonna make this person instead blood group O by either having the AA or AO genotype um, and, and see how that complicates matters. Well, again, let's look up at the top at the type one chain, the naked boring type one chain in this setting where you have both Lewis enzyme and secretor enzyme, the same principle applies that I showed you before. Secretor enzyme acts much, much more rapidly and much better um, on those type one chains, turns the vast majority of them into type one H. The Lewis enzyme acts on a very few, changes them into Lewis A, puts the Lewis lock on them so that that chain cannot go any farther. Um, and, but then on that type one H chain that you're seeing on the right side of the screen, it has two options as well. But we're, we've made this person blood group A, 
um, as opposed to blood group O. So rather than just the one pathway where the Lewis enzyme can act, that chain can either be acted on by the A enzyme or the Lewis enzyme. Well, you can probably guess what's coming by the size of the arrows, but the A enzyme, just like the secretor enzyme, is big, bad, and tough, and it acts much more frequently than the Lewis enzyme on that type 1 H and turns the vast majority of those chains into a type 1 a antigen. Again, these are floating around in plasma as well as in secretions, um, and it, they are type 1 A antigen. The Lewis enzyme will act on a few of those chains and, and again, turn, it in, turn that chain into an H and a Lewis B. Uh, obviously, it was H before, but turn it into Lewis B. So they have a small amount of plain Lewis B, but the majority of that type 1 H is going to be changed into blood group A. And then after that, the Lewis enzyme can come along and act on that A chain add its fucose in the appropriate location and turn that chain into a chain that carries both the A antigen and the Lewis B antigen. And that will by far and away be the most frequent antigen that you see in a person whose blood group A, uh, and the same principle applies for blood group B, um, and carries an active Lewis gene and an active secretor gene. Okay, I hope that that makes sense to you. And, and and what I want to review with you now is basically what you just saw. That the Lewis enzyme, when it acts on a particular substrate, will turn it into potentially a different antigen. So here are the four substrates that we talked about. If, if the Lewis the Lewis enzyme acts on a plain type 1 chain, it's going to, in that first column, in that first row there, it's going to make it Lewis A because it adds a fucose in the appropriate location. That by itself is a Lewis A. If it acts on an, a type 1 H antigen, in other words, the big bad secretor enzyme has already been there, that type 1 H antigen is turned into Lewis B. I hope that makes sense because the, both fucose is there, Lewis B. Now that chain will also, by the way, have H antigenic activity. Don't let me mislead you. A type 1 A antigen, in other words, if both the secretor enzyme and the A enzyme have acted on that type 1 chain, Lewis coming along at that point turns that chain into both, it leaves it as A, but it turns it into Lewis B. And then type 1 B, the same principle, um, the activity at the end of the Lewis, by the Lewis enzyme, uh, leaves the group B antigenic activity and changes it into a Lewis B. Okay, so with that being said, let's talk about how this all fits together in terms of how we even get these antigens on the surface of our red cells. This is really important to understand because remember I said these are type 1 chains, not type 2 chains. So they're floating around free in plasma as glycolipids as you see here. And in a person who has both, Lewis, uh, both the Lewis enzyme and the secretor enzyme, the vast majority of those chains will be Lewis B and a very tiny number of them will be Lewis A. Now again, for simplicity, I'm going to make this blood group O you understand that if the person is A or B, then those Lewis B chains would be A Lewis B or B Lewis B. Um, at, at but let's keep it simple from, from this perspective. The way I think of this is basically three compartments. Um, we've got the, these plasma glycolipids that are floating around free, carrying these Lewis antigens. You've got red cells that, that have glycolipids on their surface, and those glycolipids, interestingly enough, can exchange freely with, the, with these Lewis carrying glycolipids. More on that in just a second. And in addition, floating around free in the plasma, you've also got a whole bunch of lipoproteins. And again, these Lewis antigens can freely interchange with these lipoproteins. So basically, if you think about it in three compartments, kind of an equilibrium forms. It's not a perfect e equilibrium by any means, but but basically the, the Lewis and the sorry, the Lewis antigens will work their way between all three of these compartments. So in the beginning, the Lewis B antigens will bind to some of these lipoproteins and they'll kind of be exchanged in and out freely from that lipoprotein surface. Uh, they'll it be bound to the lipoprotein, then they'll be exchanged off, then they'll go on, then they'll go off. It's a free interchange. And the same free interchange occurs on red cells. So some of these Lewis, some of these Lewis B chains will, as they're floating around, will be integrated into the membrane, then they'll be expelled from the membrane. So it's a, it's a gradual free exchange, basically, between the surface of the red cell and the, 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 Lewis, and the Lewis antigens floating around in the plasma. And that's the reason that we say that most red cells in people with both Lewis and secretor, secretor enzymes, I should say, will be Lewis A negative, B positive. There's just so much more Lewis B than there is Lewis A. Now, if you, if, to be, to to tell you the truth, if you look super, super closely and, and extraordinarily sensitively 
at the surface of those red cells, you actually will see a tiny amount of Lewis A, but it's not enough to be detectable phenotypically when we're testing the red cells with anti-Lewis A and anti-Lewis B. So you're gonna see this diagram again in just a minute. Hold, hold on to that thought for just a second. Let's go back and let's take a look again at the gene. Let's pull it all together. The genes, the Lewis antigens that are formed as a result of those genes, how the secretions look, and how the red cells look. So let's start with a person that, that has both a Lewis uh, active Lewis allele and an active secretor allele. That's column one. As we've discussed, the Lewis antigens that will be made is, is both Lewis A and Lewis B. However, Lewis B will be made substantially more than Lewis A, and that's what you'll see in, in people's secretions in plasma. Lewis B much greater than Lewis A, and for reasons we just described on the surface of the red cells, those individuals would be Lewis A negative, B positive. Okay, let's take one of those active alleles away, and let's say this person has a non-secretor. Roughly 80% of the Caucasian population are non-secretors. That's not correct. Roughly 20% of the Caucasian population are non-secretors. My apologies. Um, so in, this individual in column, in, sorry, in row two has an active Lewis allele, but is a non-secretor. In that case, it's impossible to make Lewis B. Without the secretor allele, you cannot make Lewis B. So all of the type one chains that are modified by the Lewis antigen will be Lewis A. You'll only have Lewis A in secretions in plasma, and you will only have Lewis A on the surface of your red cells. Now, if you take away the Lewis allele, then for obvious reasons, despite what, it doesn't matter what secretor allele you have, the only antigen you can make out of a type one chain is H and A or B, depending on your genotype, but no Lewis antigens whatsoever. So no Lewis antigens in your secretions in plasma, and no Lewis antigens on the surface of your red cell. Okay, uh, where, so where do we find these Lewis antigens? We've already kind of described it. They're widely expressed in body fluids, both in secretions as well as in plasma. And please remember again that they are glycolipids in plasma and glycoproteins in secretions. It's thought that the glycolipids in plasma may come from the GI tract, but that's not completely certain. Um, they are on red cells kind of passively, again, freely exchanging back and forth and being integrated and then expelled from the red cell membrane. They're on endothelial cells. And uh, newborns, interesting, go through, go through uh, a transition with their Lewis phenotype. In fact, newborns are born Lewis A negative, B negative, and that's massively important when we talk about hemolytic disease of the newborn later on. All newborns are Lewis A negative, B negative on their red cells, though they have antigens in their, in their plasma and in their secretions. But they transition through a red cell phenotype of Lewis A positive, B negative, and then Lewis A positive, B positive, and ultimately finally reach adult type for their Lewis uh, phenotype, which is usually Lewis A negative B positive by age six or so. Well, what about the antibodies in the Lewis system? Well, the reality is that, that while I think that the Lewis antigens are very interesting, the Lewis antibodies are not really all that exciting. They're actually completely clinically insignificant for the most part with a few exceptions. So let's talk about them. They are primarily IgM. They have a feature that a lot of IgM blood group antibodies have, which is they're naturally occurring, meaning you don't have to be exposed through pregnancy or transfusion in order to make these antibodies. You're exposed just through nature, basically, where many of these antigens are kind of ubiquitous in nature. Now, there are some exceptions to the naturally occurring rule in the Lewis system, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. These antibodies are seen primarily in Lewis A negative, B negative people, and not in Lewis A positive B negative, well actually somewhat in Lewis A positive B negative, but hardly ever in Lewis A negative B positive. Again, more on that in just a sec. So there's two main types of antibodies, anti-Lewis A and anti-Lewis B, but there's some variants with anti-Lewis B that we'll talk about in a sec. Let's talk about anti-Lewis A first. This is far and away more common than anti-Lewis B. It's fairly commonly seen in people who are Lewis A negative, B negative. The statistics say one in 300 or so people in that setting will make an anti-Lewis A. But for reasons that I hope will be clear, you almost never see an anti-Lewis A in a person whose, whose red cells are Lewis A negative, B positive. And I hope, again, that should be obvious from our discussion before. Remember, if your red cells are Lewis A negative B positive, you still have Lewis A floating around. They just don't get onto the red cells in significant quantities. So if you have Lewis A, you wouldn't expect to make an anti-Lewis A. And in fact, the vast majority of people don't. The antibody is IgM. It's cold reacting, meaning it reacts best below body temperatures. And really, they can be ignored unless they react at body temperature. And in that setting, they have rarely been shown to cause hemolytic transfusion reactions. If they do react at body temperature, the way most transfusion services manage this is they don't look for Lewis A negative cells. They actually just give cross-match compatible 
compatible blood, um, and that cross-match compatible blood does not ha um, have significant risk of, of causing of leading to hemolysis, I should say. Now, anti-Lewis B has a couple of different variants. It's considerably less common than anti-Lewis A, but all of them have in common the fact that they are IgM and cold reacting, again, reacting best below body temperatures. But it, there are two forms of Lewis B antibodies, one of which reacts depending on how much H is present on the red cells, and the other of which is completely independent of how much H is on the red cells. And let's talk about that. The first is so-called anti-Lewis B H. Not surprisingly, these antibodies react best when both Lewis B and H are present on the red cell. Now, the, to be clear, the Lewis B comes from a type 1 chain that's passively adsorbed and exchanged, as we've already described. The H that we're describing is primarily talking about the type 2 chains that are already integrally bound to the red cells. And what I mean by that, if you look at people who are blood group O or A2, people that are O or A2 have a ton of H, type 2 H, on the surface of their red cells. That just makes sense because they, they have not converted their chains into either um, in, in the case of blood group O, either A or B, and in the case of A2, they have a, a, an A transferase that is not as active as that in A1, so they have considerably more H than an A1. So individuals like this, this antibody, anti-Lewis BH, will react very well and very strongly against Lewis B positive cells that are either O or A2. On the other hand, if you take the same antibody and react it against red cells that are either A1 or A1B, and you can see on the surface of those cells, there's hardly any H on either one of those. It's very possible that that antibody could be completely non-reactive. And on the other hand, anti-Lewis B L, as you see up there, anti-Lewis BL is completely independent of H. It'll react against Lewis B positive red cells regardless of the amount of H. And you can see in this example, blood group O, no problem, blood group A1B, no problem. This is, in, in fact, anti-Lewis BL, the best Lewis B antibody to use to actually phenotype red cells. Because you can see, if you use anti-Lewis BH, you could get false negatives in a person who was A1B, for example, for, the, for their Lewis B uh, phenotype. Okay, let's go on and talk about, we talked about the antibodies, and again, these antibodies are, are essentially insignificant for the most part. Um, when we say insignificant, we're talking about hemolytic transfusion reactions as well as hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn. And there's a couple reasons why these antibodies are in, are, don't matter for hemolytic disease of the newborn. First, these antibodies are primarily IgM. And as you know, to an IgM, the, the, the placenta is basically a brick wall. IgM can't get across the placenta very well. But even if there was an IgG component, component to this, even if you had an IgG as a part of this, and that IgG could cross the placenta, remember, as I said before, baby red cells are Lewis A negative, B negative, so there's nothing for that antibody to grab onto and attack. So no, no significant risk whatsoever of uh, hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn for a couple reasons with, uh, with Lewis antibodies. A couple of unique things about Lewis. Well, Lewis antibodies can be neutralized by using saliva from someone who has a Lewis gene or an active Lewis uh, enzyme. So saliva tests are just a way that you can actually fairly simply determine Lewis gene presence. And th this is kind of gross and people get kind of freaked out about this. You actually take saliva from the individual, you boil it and make sure that it's appropriately isotonic and you mix it with reagent anti-Lewis A. And what we see is that, re is that that saliva containing Lewis A will neutralize the antibody so that when you then add Lewis A positive red cells, you'll get no agglutination whatsoever. Again, it's a simple, easy way to determine what someone's uh, Lewis genotype is because if you've got Lewis A, by definition, you have an active Lewis allele. Um, okay, a couple of unique things that we should look at when we talk about uh, when we talk about the Lewis system. Um, first is that well, you probably have been wondering what the the lizard on the slide is. Um, in fact, Lewis it's a chameleon. Come on, Lewis is in fact a chameleon. Red cells will change rapidly from the donor type to the recipient Lewis type. It can be over the span of hours or it can be over the span of days. But for example, if you look at a chameleon, a chameleon goes from one environment to another and changes and looks different and matches its environment. Lewis, uh, the, the Lewis type of red cells does exactly the same thing. If you take a, a red cell that's Lewis A negative, B positive, and put that in an environment that's Lewis A negative, B negative, over the course of time, again, it can be hours or it can sometimes be days, those Lewis Bs are going to gradually fade from view and you're going to end up with a red cell that looks Lewis A negative, B negative. That's another reason why these antibodies don't tend to cause uh, significant reactions because the, the antigens will change um, and there won't be much of a target left. Um, the, the other thing that's, that people talk about very widely and it's really important to understand is the, the way that people's Lewis 
uh, phenotype will change during pregnancy. So for example, you've already seen this, this diagram, and I told you before that the Lewis bees will integrate freely and exchange back and forth between the red cells and the lipoproteins, and so you'll get somewhat of an equilibrium. Again, it's not a perfect equi equilibrium, it's just easiest to describe this way. But what happens during pregnancy? During pregnancy, a couple of big things occur that you really need to be aware of. And the first thing that happens during pregnancy is that the patient, that mom's plasma volume increases. So as a result of the plasma volume increasing, there's somewhat less of a drive. There's a, a generalized decrease in, at least in the concentration of the Lewis B antigens. Not a decrease in their amount, but it's somewhat of a decrease in the concentration and a little bit of a decreased drive for those, for those Lewis B antigens to move on to the red cells. So again, somewhat of a decrease there as well. But you, the, the more important thing from our perspective most likely is the fact that it's been pretty clearly shown that in pregnancy, the amount of circulating lipoproteins goes up substantially. So there's a bigger draw for those Lewis B antigens to move on over and bind to the lipoproteins. And as a result, there's a draw from the Lewis, for the Lewis, anti, Lewis B antigens to move from the red cells back into the plasma. Now again, this is not a perfect equilibrium, and please don't hold me to this in terms of the scientific chemical balances that we're talking about here, but, it, but this is functionally the way it works, so that these red cells go from being Lewis A negative, B, B positive, as most adults are, into looking Lewis A negative, B negative. Again, if you look really, really, really closely with very, very sensitive reagents, you will see some residual Lewis B antigens and Lewis A antigens on the surface of the red cells, but they decrease enough that in fact, and this is odd, this patient can even make make an anti-Lewis B in that setting. Now, those antibodies are weak and, and, the, and again, the antigens are still around. And those antibodies don't cause any problems. They're just nuisances more than anything. Um, and again, for reasons that we've already described, these antibodies don't cause hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn. Another odd thing about the Lewis system is the, the issues with the enzymes. And we, th we think about, I've already described to you the secretor allele and the secretor enzyme is big and bad and tough, but there is a variant of the secretor allele called the SE W allele, or the weak secretor allele, that's seen rarely in Caucasians and African Americans, but is seen really commonly um, in Asians. So as a result of that, the secretor allele that you think of that way as the big bad super secretor actually kind of, well, it's just kind of more like this. And as a result, the secretor enzyme and the Lewis enzyme basically are on equal footing in that battle that I described to you before of a, a taking a type 1 chain. So if you're getting both Lewis activity and secretor enzyme activity at basically the same rate, it's shouldn't surprise you that when we look at our chart that I showed you before and we add a new line on the bottom that says that now this person has a Lewis gene and has a weak secretor enzyme as a result of either being homozygous for that gene or um, heterozygous with the second the second allele being um, a, a, a non-secretor basically. As a result, you're going to get Lewis A and Lewis B being formed, but it's going to be essentially equal. And that what you, that you'll see that in the secretions, you'll see that in the plasma. And this is really the only situation where adults normally can have the Lewis A positive, B positive phenotype. And it's again, it's not very common in, in, in people other than Asians, and because as, as you've already, you've already probably already surmised, the vast majority of people, well certainly the majority of people, are Lewis A negative, B negative as adults. Uh, a few people are going to be Lewis A negative, sorry, and I may have said Lewis A negative, B negative first. On the top line we have Lewis A negative, B positive. Uh, most adults are that way. A few people are Lewis A negative, B negative. In fact, that's seen in almost 25%, 22% to be specific of African Americans. And then you have a small number of, of Caucasians and African Americans, but a considerably larger number of Asians that have the weak secretor enzyme. So as a result, they're Lewis A positive, B positive. A couple more things real fast and then we'll wrap this up. In terms of the, the effect of proteolytic enzymes, Lewis system antigens are enhanced like everything else in the ABO system um, and the ABO family. The, the, the en enzymes will act and make the Lewis system antigens react stronger uh, so that the antibodies appear to react stronger. And, and here's just the principle of enzymes if you haven't seen this before. Enzymes like Fison and Papain will go on and will cleave, pro will cleave proteins on the surface. This can work in one of two ways. On the surface, you, have, you may have significantly uh, dense glycoproteins, such as in the M blood group system, and when you throw in enzymes, for example, on M positive red cells, those enzymes go and cleave the, uh, the, the glycoproteins at the surface, making the antigens react in a weaker manner. And that just makes sense, and that's why MNS antigens are decreased by the use of proteolytic enzymes. In other cases, however, the, the, 
the enzymes can actually act to make things a little more obvious and make uh, less prominent antigens seem more prominent. So for example, uh, if you imagine an antigen that's present down near the surface of the red cell, um, it's easy to imagine how a, a red, uh, sorry, an antibody can come in and try to bind, but it can't quite get there because of all the debris in the way, all these high, high-flying glycoproteins at the surface. So you throw a proteolytic enzyme into that scenario, the enzyme cleaves those proteins, and then you have the opportunity for that antibody to go and bind more tightly to the red cells. And that's what we see in the Lewis blood group system. There's one very important disease association you should be aware of with Lewis, and that is the association with Helicobacter pylori. Here you see a nice diagram on the right uh, from the nobelprize.org website that basically shows that Helicobacter is a bacteria that causes peptic ulcer disease. It binds to the, the, the distal part of the stomach, the antrum that you see there um, in the image. It binds, it burrows into the red uh, burrows into the epithelial cells, the gastric epithelial cells, and can cause peptic ulcers, which can be a significant cause of bleeding. Now, Helicobacter actually binds to Lewis B in order to get into those gastric epithelial cells. And you can see here how it's kind of burrowing through the mucosa, getting into the epithelial cells um, and causing, uh, leading to a scenario of potentially peptic ulcer disease. Now, it's important to know that Norwalk virus also does a similar thing. It's just not quite as well worked out as with Helicobacter. Okay, guys, well, that is actually it for today. I, I want to extend my thanks to, to the first three people on the list, list Connie Howard, Cami Mellon, and Monica Lassar, uh, not only for helping me with the content of this particular lecture, but also for being mentors in immunohematology for me. Any good stuff that you see here is really due to them. Any of the screw-ups belong to me and not to them. Uh, finally, I want to thank the, the pathology residents at Cedar sinai where I work uh, as my day job. Um, I, I mention them simply because they allow they allow me to test some of this crazy stuff on them and, and get it, get all excited about systems like the Lewis blood group system, which are clinically insignificant, but it's fun. Um, and they really let me know quickly what works and what doesn't. So thank you very much to them. Thanks very much to you for hanging around. Thanks very much for for being with me today for this for this podcast. Um, I hope it's been helpful. I hope you understand the Lewis system in a little bit better. And really, I hope you had just a little bit of fun. Take care. Talk to you later and see you next time.